Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, always a delight to, to realize, gee, there are a few people even in the United States that have learned about my work, so I'm always <laughs> delighted to uh, come down for this. I'm especially happy to come to, to Madison while well, at this beautiful time of the year, but I spent two years commuting from uh, Canada to, to Madison as my wife worked on her PhD here at the University of Wisconsin. So many happy memories to come back to this wonderful town. I, uh, I'm deeply honored to, to receive that, uh, that award. I thank you very much for this. But I have to, to say that it has really been the many people who have watched, listened, and read uh, my work that have allowed me to have a long uh, public career. So I really am grateful to the public that have uh, supported me. And there, of course, a lot of people go into making television programs, radio shows, and writing books, uh, publishing books. This is all a team effort from many, many people. But I do say that there was one person who really made it possible, my wife, Dr. Tara Cullis, who, uh, who's uh, left a a teaching career at Harvard to uh, work full-time on environmental issues in Canada and uh, was a co-founder of the David Suzuki Foundation. Environmental education, I think without question, is the most critical need that North American society has today. And I just want to remind you of how difficult this challenge is. In 1988, around the world, Awareness and concern about the environment had reached its absolutely peak. I'm sure many of you don't remember that in 1988, a man ran for president and said, if you elect me, I will be an environmental president. And his name was George H.W. Bush. There wasn't a green bone in his body, but he said it because Americans had put the environment at the top of the agenda. Margaret Thatcher, in 1988, was photographed picking up uh, litter in, in Hyde Park, and she turned to camera and said, well, I'm a greenie too. In 1988, Canada re-elected Brian Mulroney, Prime Minister, and to show he cared about the environment, he appointed his brightest star, a man named Lucien Bouchard, to be the, uh, the Minister of the Environment. I interviewed him three months later, and I said, Mr. Bouchard, what do you think is the most important issue facing to Canadians today? And right away, he said, global warming. That was impressive. And I said, how serious an issue is it? And these are his exact words. It threatens the survival of our species. We must act now. 1988, that was a year climatologists gathered in Toronto for a conference and they were so concerned that the evidence was in that humans were causing global warming that at the end of the conference, they issued a press release that said global warming represents a threat to human survival second only to nuclear war. And they called for a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 15 years. It was all there. The scientists had spoken. Politicians had heard the word. The public was very concerned. And you all know what has happened in the interval between then and now. As, we, as I speak, we have the debate between uh, one of the major uh, parties that, in which, uh, who claims that climate change is a, a hoax perpetrated by China. Every one of the 16 or 17 candidates for leadership in the Republican uh, Party for the presidency is a climate denier. Our challenge is pretty darned great, it seems to me. So we've got a big challenge. And the challenge is especially poignant when you consider that we are at an absolutely critical moment in, the very, in, in all of the history of our species. What we do or do not do in the next few years could very well determine whether we survive as a species within this century. That's not me speaking. That's what some of the eminent scientists in the world are saying. Last year, uh, the eminent uh, royal astronomer, Sir Martin Rees, was asked on BBC, what are the chances people will be around by the end of this century? And his answer was 50-50. Uh, James Lovelock, the man who used the word uh, Gaia to describe all of life on Earth, uh, wrote a book in which he says 90% of humanity will be gone by the 
by the 2100. And uh, Clive Hamilton, an eco-philosopher in Australia, has written a book, Requiem for a Species, and We Are the Species the Requiem is for. <laughs> and the American <coughs> ecologist, uh, Guy McPherson, uh, uh, Professor Emeritus, has actually put a date on when we're going to disappear as a species, and it's this century. Well, taken all together then, uh, it's clear that, that uh, many eminent scientists are saying we are at a very critical moment uh, in, in terms of our species presence on Earth. Many are saying we've passed too many critical thresholds to be able to go back, that it's too late. And to them, I say thank you for warning us of the sense of urgency but before you say it's too late, please go away and shut the hell up. Because there's no point in saying that. You can't say that if you want people to do something about it. It is just totally soul-destroying to say, no, it's, it's too late. We can't. And I, I say that we can't say it's too late because we don't know enough to even say with surety that it is too late. And I want to point out uh, a, a phenomenon the, the, one of the most prized species of salmon in the world is called a sockeye salmon. It's a salmon with a bright red uh, uh, fatty flesh that we all love. And the largest run of sockeye salmon in the world is in the Fraser River in British Columbia, my home province. In 2009, we got barely over a million sockeye returning to the Fraser. We like to get up around 25 to 30 million coming back. And, and in 2009, there were just over 1 million. And I remember vividly turning to my wife and saying, that's it, there just isn't enough biomass to get them up to the spawning beds. They're going, they're, they're dead, they're extinct. The next year, we got the biggest run of sockeye salmon in 100 years. I use that not to show how stupid I am. <laughs> Nobody knew what the heck happened. We still don't know what happened, but nature shocked us. And I believe there are many more shocks, some good, some bad, that nature is holding up her sleeve. But we've got to give her space, help her, and hope that there, there are many surprises, good surprises, still to come. But it is very, very late. We are in a period, a short period, that scientists now call the Anthropocene, a period when humans have become the dominant factor shaping the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. There's never been a single species able to have the impact that we are now having. And you all know that it's the result of the sudden conjunction of a number of factors, population. In all of the time that humans have existed. There were never a billion human beings until the early 1800s. I was born in 1936 when there were just over two billion people. In my lifetime, in a single human lifetime, the population has more than tripled. And every one of the additions to the population have required air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat and shelter and clothing. We have a very big ecological footprint. But of course, we're not like uh, any other species. We have technology that enables us to explore and exploit virtually every nook and cranny on the planet. And that uh, technological ability is now going to serve that incredible consumptive appetite that we have. We love to shop. And every bit of what we buy and use comes out of the earth. And when we're finished with it, it goes back into the earth. And all of that elevates our ecological footprint. And I just have to go on a rant because I've seen so many... Uh, we are such an absurd species. We are so wealthy now that we actually pay hundreds of dollars to buy blue jeans that have got rips already cut into them. <laughs> what a disgusting idea! Is that what we've achieved with this consumptive appetite? And of course, our global economy is serving that hyper-consumption. And all of that added together means that we are having, we have become a force of nature that is now not only changing the properties of the planet, but we are undermining the very life support systems of the earth. 
And the problem with that is we are a very clever animal. We are able to invent so much technology. But we aren't humble enough to understand that we still are so ignorant about the, the way the world works that we can't anticipate the consequences of what we are doing. And so we constantly find ourselves in trouble. When DDT was invented, we thought this was a great invention. Paul Mueller won the Nobel Prize for, in, for discovering DDT killed insects in 1948. But it was only when eagles began to disappear, bird watchers began to ask what's going on, that we discovered a phenomenon that biologists never even knew about called biomagnification, amplify the concentration up the food chain. We, um, when we dropped atomic bombs on Japan in 1945, we didn't know there was a thing called radioactive fallout. That was discovered years later when bombs were tested over bikini. And when CFCs began to be used in massive quantities in spray cans, no one knew that they would float up into the atmosphere and ultraviolet light would cleave chlorine-free radicals off CFCs, and chlorine is a scavenger of ozone. When scientists began to say CFCs are breaking down ozone, my response was, what ozone layer? I didn't even know there was an ozone layer up there to, uh, to break down. So over and over again, we can invent powerful technologies, but the consequence we can't anticipate. And now we're actually tampering with very powerful tools with the very essence of, of life itself, the genetic blueprint, the DNA, that makes us what we are. And we think we can control it with our GMOs. We're inventing machines now that will be intelligent, artificial intelligent, and we're playing with nanotechnology. And I think we ought to learn from the history of the technologies that have created problems uh, for us already. We, um, oops, I, um, the, the, the question then is, how on earth did we get to this point in our evolutionary history? As a geneticist, I've been astounded at the way that scientists today can use DNA, the genetic material, to track or trace the movement of human beings over time. And all of the trails of our movements lead back to Africa 150,000 years ago. I can't wait for the K Ku Klux Klan to invite me to give a lecture so I can tell them, what the hell is your problem? We're all Africans, for God's sakes. So the plains of Africa were our birthplace, where our species emerged. And that's where we belonged. But over time, we began to move. We don't know why humans moved off, their, off our natural habitat. Maybe there were population pressures. If, if so, the, our population was growing very, very slowly. Maybe we depleted resources. I like to think it was uh, teenage boys who were in search of some action. You know, we bred, with, we bred with Neanderthals, and maybe they were checking over the mountains for some Neanderthal ladies. I, I, I like to think that way, but uh, whatever the reasons, we began to move. And as we moved into new ecosystems, we were an invasive species. We had no idea how it all worked. This is new. But boy, we saw some big birds with no wings. They were easy to catch and they, were, they tasted yummy. And we began to, to knock them out. Those slow-moving sloths, man, they were, a, they were a big catch, provided a lot of food. And if you follow the movement of human beings across the planet, you can trace a wave of extinction that followed us as we moved. Even with clubs and sticks and, and, and stone axes, we were a very deadly predator because we were smart. And uh, at some point as we, be, we moved to new places, people began to realize, holy cow, there aren't as many animals around. Or there are those plants that we used to use, are, there aren't many, they're hard to find. And so they had to make a choice. Are they going to move to look for more or are they going to stay and live in a different way? And I believe the folks that stayed were the roots of indigenous culture. It was the lessons, hard-won lessons, that people learned through the mistakes, the failures, the successes of their ancestors that were remembered as vital lessons over time. 
that became the body of indigenous knowledge. And that indigenous knowledge was critical for survival, and it worked because people lived on the basis of that knowledge for thousands of years. Around the world, then, indigenous knowledge is place-based and critical for survival through the learned experiences of ancestors. And science will never duplicate that knowledge, can't duplicate that knowledge. So uh, that, I think for me, that was a, a very important insight as I thought about the evolutionary history of our species. That what it, the tragedy of our time is that basis of knowledge that has been so successful at allowing people to live sustainably over thousands of years is now on the brink of disappearing all over the, the, the planet. Disappearing because of that huge wave of exploration, uh, conquest, colonization that began over 500 years ago. And I think about my own history in North America, and it's a part of that process of uh, the loss of our indigenous cultures. My grandparents emigrated to Canada between 1902 and 1906. They were driven out of Japan by ignorance and, and poverty, extreme poverty. They were uneducated, but they came to Canada because they had heard there was opportunity. And uh, they knew nothing of indigenous people, so they weren't able to learn anything from the original people. And they saw land as their opportunity. Work hard, buy land. If there are trees on it, cut them down and sell it. If there's good topsoil, grow vegetables and sell them. If there are fish, catch them and, and sell them. To them, land represented their future and opportunity. My mother and father were born and raised in Vancouver. And like most of the Japanese Canadian immigrants, uh, children of immigrants, they had no grandparents or elders. They were still in the old country. And so my parents grew up rootless, they had no roots in Japan, and they had no roots in North America. And so what we've seen is, over the last 500 years, the conquest and colonization of the indigenous cultures, and spreading over that, then, the takeover of the new culture based on resourcism, the exploitation of resources that were found. So I can shift gears a little. I lived in the United States for eight years, getting an education in the United States that wasn't possible in Canada at that time, between 1954 and 1962. And as I was starting my senior year at Amherst College in 1957, on October 4th, the Soviet Union shocked the world by launching Sputnik. I didn't know there was a space program. It was an electrifying thing. But every hour and a half, that beep, beep, beep from Sputnik as it went overhead was a, a reminder of the Soviet technological uh, uh, prowess. And America then immediately tried to get its rockets into air from all of the three armed services. Each of them had their own rocket. And every one blew up on the launch pad. I remember that vividly because it was they blew up on, on television. And... Uh, Meanwhile, the Russians launched the first animal in space, a dog, Laika. The first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. The first team of cosmonauts. The first spacewalk. The first woman, Valentina Tereshkova. The United States, the response was absolutely astonishing. Americans didn't blink. They just said, we've got to catch up to these guys. In 1961, when President Kennedy announced that uh, American astronauts would get to the moon within a decade. Uh, that was the, the announcement that they were entering a space race. The, he didn't have a clue. No one had a clue how the hell they were going to do it. But he set the target. And it was a glorious time to be a scientist or a science student, I'll tell you. Here I was, a Canadian, living in the United States. All you had to do was say, gee, I like science. They threw money at you. It was great. <laughs> I, I didn't even apply for jobs, and I got offers of many jobs from American universities. Uh, it was a glorious time, but 
It was so impressive that the American commitment was real and, and unwavering. And the consequence was what? Not only was the United States the only country to land people on the moon, and you, you did it before the 10-year the time period that Kennedy had announced, but every, every year uh, NASA publishes a magazine called Spinoff that lists dozens of spin-off products that have come out of the space program. You know, things like GPS, uh, laptop computers, 24-hour uh, uh, channel, tele well, maybe that's not so great, news, <laughs> news networks, uh, space blankets, cochlear implants. I mean, the, the list now of hundreds of spin-offs of the space program is very, very impressive. None of that was planned. No one knew this would happen. All it took was a commitment to get people to the moon and back within a decade. And every year, since that program was NASA was started, who gets the bulk of the of the uh, Nobel prizes in science? It's the United States or immigrants to the United States. All of that has resulted because of the commitment to beat the Russians into space. And I say it's un-American to say we can't do anything about climate change. It'll destroy the economy. That's not the way America responded when I lived here. It's un-American to say that. I would think that Americans would take that challenge and say, damn it, we can do it, and let's get on with it. <laughs> I returned to Canada in 1962, and I had been trained in genetics, and boy, I was determined to become a hotshot geneticist, and I was completely sidetracked by a woman. <laughs> Most of the time that's been a disaster, but in this case, I'm ever grateful to her. My greatest regret is I never met her. She died two years later, but Rachel Carson published a book called Silent Spring in 1962. And as I read the book as a scientist, I was stunned by it to realize that science is very, very powerful. Reductionism, which is the essence of genetics, allows us to focus on a part of nature and learn everything about that bit of nature. But even though we do our studies, say, in test tubes or Florence flasks or growth chambers or even tests in fields, science doesn't enable us to see the big picture in which everything is connected to everything else. So scientists couldn't imagine that you spray chemicals onto fields to kill insect pests and you end up affecting fish and birds and human beings. That for me was a shock and changed the way I looked at the, the world and, and science. And I realized through Rachel Carson's uh, validate, or collecting all of the information that scientists didn't know about biomagnification up the food chain. And so as a result of her book, I, like millions of people around the world, was swept up in the environmental movement. When her book came out, there wasn't a single department of the environment in any government on earth. The, the word environment has simply come to mean something very different from what we understood it to be in 1962. So because of, of her work, we got, I got involved in British Columbia in many issues of clear-cut logging. We, uh, we battled over uh, uh, oil pro uh, proposals to drill for oil in uh, on the BC coast, uh, to drill for oil in Alaska, to bring oil super tankers down the BC coast. Uh, we battled and, and in many cases we won. We stopped the American proposal to bring oil super tankers off the north slopes of Alaska down through BC waters to be refined in Seattle. We stopped that. We stopped the proposal, and I was involved uh, fighting the proposals, these riders that you attach to bills in the states that let you sneak things in. We stopped the riders that were going to allow uh, drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the, the calving grounds of the porcupine uh, caribou herd. Uh, we stopped the proposal to drill in Hecate Strait off BC. We stopped dams on the Peace River and down in uh, Brazil at Altamira. Um, we celebrated these as great victories 
uh, in the environmental movement. And the shocking thing to me is that today, 30, 35 years later, each of these issues I just cited is back and we're fighting the exact same fight over again. A big battle on the Peace River at Site C. We stopped that dam, but now it's being built. We stopped the dam in Altamira in Brazil. It's being built. We uh, stopped the proposal to bring oil through our waters, but guess what? Now we're proposing to take Canadian super tankers through BC waters. And the, and the drive to drill in Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Hecate Strait is still there. And so I've understood that in, as environmentalists, we fundamentally failed to use those battles to change the way that we see our place on the planet. We failed to shift the paradigm, the perspective, and so these battles will continue to return again and again. So let me give you a couple of stories that will give you insight into the nature of the battles we confront. In the 1980s, I was called by the Lytton Indian Band and asked if I would help them uh, prevent logging in the, Lytton, the Stein Valley, which they consider theirs, and it is theirs, but they consider it sacred. The British Columbia government had given a logging permit to Fletcher Challenge, a New Zealand forest company, to log the Stein Valley. And so I agreed to, uh, to, to help them, and at some point in this battle with Fletcher Challenge, I accidentally ran into a group and very quickly realized, holy cow, this one of these guys is the CEO of Fletcher Challenge. And uh, he also very quickly recognized, that, holy cow, this shit disturber is David Suzuki. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, what began as a polite, how, hello, how are you, escalated into a shouting match. And he said, listen, Suzuki, I can tell you how many board feet of lumber there are in this valley, how many cubic meters of pulp there are, and how many jobs and how much money I'll make. And uh, are tree huggers like you willing to pay for, for those trees? Because if, they're not, if you're not willing to pay that money, they don't have any value until someone cuts them down. So here I was trying to say, well, you could pick berries in there every winter and, or every spring. And, uh, you could cut some salal uh, bushes and, and use them in flower arrangement. And maybe we'll find a cure for cancer. But the real reasons we were fighting for the, Lytton, uh, for the Stein Valley was the valley is sacred. What is the value? How do you put a price on something that is sacred? That forest, as long as it was intact and healthy, was taking carbon out of the air and putting oxygen back in it. Not a bad service for an animal like us. Without, all, without the green things in the oceans and on land, we wouldn't be here. The photosynthesis is taking carbon, removing carbon, restoring or adding more oxygen to the atmosphere. But th when you cut the trees down and lose that, you know what economists say? Oh, well, that's an externality. That, that lost function is not relevant to the economy. It's not in the economy. That forest is pumping millions of gallons of water out of the soil and transpiring it into the air, affecting weather and climate. Externality. The Soil, uh, the roots of the trees are holding the soil, so when it rains, that soil doesn't run into the spawning beds of the salmon, irrelevant to the economy. That forest provides habitat for countless other species of insects and birds and mammals and, and, uh, and plants. All of those ecological or ecosystem services that the intact forest is providing are excluded from consideration by the economy. And so I'm left, if I'm going to argue in a economic terms, arguing with this CEO of Fletcher Challenge in terms of picking berries and salal bushes. So it'll never work. Ecological issues will never be won if we enter into that ecologic, uh, economic realm and attempt to justify what we're doing on economic terms. So three, four years ago, I got a call from the CEO of one of the largest companies in Alberta's tar sands. I was surprised. He said, look, is it possible for me to come down and talk to you? I said, absolutely. I'm not into fighting. I would be honored. The next morning, he showed up at my office in Vancouver. 
And I, you know, I thanked him. I said how privileged it was, and I'm thrilled, and all that nice stuff about welcoming him. And then I said, but before you come into my office, would you do me one favor? I, I want you to leave your identity as a CEO of an oil company outside the door. I want to meet you man to man, as one human being to another. And I want to talk about what we agree on. I don't see the point of negotiating until we both start from a platform of total agreement. And then we can discuss these other issues. He wasn't very happy when I said this, but to his credit, he came in. He said, okay. He sat in my office and I said, look, I know this is awkward for you. This is not what you had in mind. But let me show you what, what I'm thinking. We live in a world that is shaped and constrained by laws of nature. And those laws are immutable. We can't change them. We live with them. In physics, we know that you can't build a rocket that will travel faster than the speed of light. The speed of light is the limit dictated to us by laws of physics. And no one says, oh, we need to build rockets that will go 100 times faster than the speed of light. That's absurd. The law of gravity says you can't build an anti-gravity machine here on Earth. We accept that. And the first and second laws of thermodynamics tell us you can't build a perpetual motion machine. Those are all principles that constrain and limit the way that we can act. And no one objects to that. That's what the world is. In chemistry, it's the same. The atomic properties of the elements, the reaction rates and diffusion constants, all indicate to us what atoms we can put together in a test tube and react and what kind of molecules we can try to synthesize. And that's dictated and limited by laws of chemistry. And again, no one tries to supersede those laws that are imposed on us. We live within it. And in biology, it's the same. And the, the maximum or optimum number of plants or animals that can live in a, an ecosystem or habitat is dictated by what's called the carrying capacity of the, that ecosystem or habitat. Exceed the carrying capacity and that species number will drop because you, you can no longer sustain that many plants or animals. Humans, of course, are not confined to a single ecosystem or habitat because we use our minds to adapt us or adapt the habitat so we can live in it. But the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists, is our habitat in the end. And there is a carrying capacity for human beings within that zone. Of course, with humans, it's a function not just of how many people there are in the world, but how much we consume per capita. And every scientist I've talked to agrees with me, we've already exceeded the carrying capacity totally for our species when you add consumption and numbers together. Well, when I say this to business people or, or politicians, they get very angry they get, when I say that. We've passed the, the carrying capacity. But they say, well, how could we be here if we're past the carrying capacity? Well, we're doing it. We're creating the illusion that everything's fine by using up the rightful legacy of our grandchildren and all future generations. We're using that up now to sustain a lifestyle that, in fact, is unsustainable uh, in the long run. So the habitat carrying capacity dictates the maximum number that can exist uh, on the planet. There are other laws that are, are uh, invoked or uh, imposed because we are biological creatures. We are animals. And as animals, we're subject to uh, biology as well. And I, I gave a talk at the Green Builders, the first Green Builders uh, conference in Austin, Texas, way back. I think it was in the late 1990s. It was a huge crowd. And there were a lot of children in the audience. And I said, now, kids, if you remember one thing from my talk, remember we are animals. Man, did their parents get pissed off at me. <laughs> Don't call my daughter an animal. We're human beings. And I said, madam, if your daughter isn't an animal, is she a plant? <laughs> because we're, we're biological creatures. And as animals... And I said to the CEO, what do you think is the most fundamental need every human being has? 
And instead of giving me the answer immediately, he went, so I knew, you know, he's thinking, money, a job, a house. I said, look, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So would you agree with me that clean air has got to be the, most high, the highest treasure we have and that protecting it must be the highest purpose in our life? He didn't say anything. <laughs> so then I said, you and I, we're 60 to 70% water. We're basically a big blob of water with enough thickener added we don't dribble away on the floor. <laughs> but, you know, the body leaks water, right? It comes out of our skin and our eyes and our mouth and our crotch and we lose water and we have to top up. And if we don't have water, Mr. CEO, for four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink contaminated water, you're sick. So surely clean water is like clean air. It is our highest priority, and protecting it must be one of our most important jobs. And then I said, with food, it's different. We can go four to six weeks without food, but eventually we die. Every bit of the food that we eat was once alive, and most of it was grown in the soil. If we have to eat polluted food, we're sick. So would you agree with me that clean food and soil are like clean water and clean air? And finally, I said every bit of the energy in our bodies that we need to move and grow and reproduce and do work, all of that energy is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis, converted into chemical energy, and then we get it by eating the plants or the animals that eat the plants, and we store it. And when we need to, to do some work, we burn those molecules of energy and release the sunlight back out into our bodies. So photosynthesis then is like clean soil and food, clean water and clean air. And those four elements are what indigenous people around the world refer to as the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And I said, Mr. CEO, the miracle of life on earth, I think, is that those four elements that we need to live and be healthy are cleansed, replenished, created by the web of living things. The air is created by plants. They create the high oxygen uh, atmosphere that we live in. It's soil, fungi, and plant roots that filter water as it percolates through the soil so that we can drink it. It is life that creates the very soil on which we grow our, our vegetables to eat. You all, I'm sure, have seen the movie The Martian and when Matt Damon gets stranded on Mars and has to stretch his potato supply from two, one year's worth to four years' worth, where the heck can you plant your potatoes? There's lots of sand, dust, and clay, but he had to dig holes in that matrix and poop in it in order to grow his potatoes because soil is created by life. Without life, there is no soil. I'm a big fan of Elon Musk's, but this idea of colonizing Mars is the looniest, <laughs> stupidest thing I have ever heard. Anyway, uh, and, it, uh, and of course, all of the energy, not only the energy that we need right now, but all of the energy that, uh, that we burn, whether it's uh, coal, oil, or gas, peat, dung, or wood, all of that is sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis that gives us the energy that we use. So biodiversity is, like earth, air, fire, and water, critical for our health, for a planet that enables a, an animal like us to live. And that, I believe, is what should be the foundation of every society on the planet for our own well-being. That clean air, clean water, clean soil and food, clean energy and biodiversity are critical elements in our lives and must be protected above all else. I said, Mr. CEO, if you would shake hands with me and agree on that, I promise you I will do everything I can to help you and your company. I'm sorry to say he couldn't do it. And I realize it was very unfair of me to do that. 
because he had come down as the CEO of an oil company to negotiate. If he were to go back to his shareholders and say, listen, I had to talk with Suzuki and I have to agree with him. Whatever we do, we can't affect the air, water, soil, or biodiversity. <laughs> He'd be fired in a flash because that's not what corporations exist for. They exist for one reason only, make money. The faster and the more, the better. And so this is a real problem we face. How do we as a species come together and set the real bottom line, which are the vital things that keep us alive, that are dictated to us by laws of biology? Other things, the borders that we draw around our property, our cities, our, our states, or our countries, those are not forces of nature. We invented them. And they are indeed changing all the time. We can change them. Nature doesn't care a hoot about boundaries that we actually will go to war and kill and, and die trying to protect. But they matter nothing to nature. We, uh, we create other things. Uh, we create uh, capitalism, the economy, corporations, markets, these are not forces of nature. They're human inventions. And yet if you read the newspapers, you'd swear that the market is a thing. Oh, a market's not doing too well today. You know, you think the market is a thing with an ice cap on its head going, oh man, I feel lousy today. The market is a human creation. Yet why are we always trying to make nature, sho shoehorn nature into our equations, our creations, make nature grow faster, to, to, to provide more products so that our, our forestry can grow or our fisheries can grow. We've got to conform our creations to fit the needs of nature. We've got it all uh, the, wrong way, the wrong way around. How do we get people to change and see that perspective in which we as biological creatures must submit ourselves to protecting the things that matter out there. And so that's why I uh, was very keen on the last campaign that my foundation uh, began two years ago, which we call the Blue Dot Movement. In Canada, we can get a constitutional amendment in two ways. One is you lobby the heck out of politicians and get them to introduce the amendment and pass it in Parliament. Or the other way, which is much more difficult, is to get grassroots support for an initiative that the provinces will then support. And we need seven out of the 10 provinces, seven out of the 10 with more than 50% of Canada's population, to support this initiative. And then it goes to Parliament in Ottawa and, and uh, the amendment is, is passed. We, um, so we said, let's get a constitutional amendment to enshrine the right to a healthy environment in our constitution. Our constitution has been changed. There was a time when women were not considered persons and they weren't allowed to vote and didn't have the rights, uh, the other rights and privileges of men. We changed that back in the 1920s. There was a time when uh, indigenous people weren't considered full members of society. They weren't allowed to vote until, I think, 1960. The, uh, there was, a, or maybe it was, uh, yeah, 49 or 48. There was a time when uh, gay people were, not con were considered to be criminal, where it was, uh, they were not guaranteed the rights and privileges of all the rest of society. That has changed. So the Constitution is not something fixed in stone. It can evolve and change. And we believe it's time to enshrine the right to a healthy environment for every Canadian. Well, what does that mean? It means every Canadian should be assured of clean air, clean water, clean soil and food, clean energy and biodiversity. So I, we embarked on this and I thought, you know, the chances of it getting through are pretty slim, but the conversation that we could bring up would be really worth, worth having to get people thinking about things in a different way. And I said, we've got to make this a bigger tent than just a bunch of environmentalists. We have to recruit the hunger and poverty people 
Because a starving person who comes across an edible plant or animal is not going to say, oh, before I eat that, is it endangered? They're going to kill it and eat it. I would. So if you don't deal with hunger and poverty, forget about the environment. If people live without any opportunity for social justice or, or equal rights, they've got other concerns that wor than worrying about the environment. Those social justice is our issue. If you have people living under war, or terrorism, or genocide, those people are, have very different priorities. And so they are a part of fighting those things has got to be a part of our battle as well. We have a big tent. So we embarked on a seven-week tour, a bus tour, a solar-powered bus, starting in the East Coast in Newfoundland and going right across Canada through 23 communities. In every community, the first people that joined us were the indigenous people of those communities. They said, well, of course. What do you think? We've been fighting for all our existence. Of course we join you and, and support you. We recruited musicians, lots of musicians, and they went from uh, people you would know perhaps, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, Neil Young, uh, Feist. There, there was just a very impressive group of musicians. We had the na nature artist Robert Bateman, the writer Margaret Atwood, Canadian Ballet, National Ballet, composed a whole piece and danced for us in Winnipeg. So we recruited a broad range of people going across the country. And we are, we're asking the grassroots to get your municipality, your city, your town, to pass uh, uh, a right to a healthy environment at the city level. And I thought if we could get one city to do this within six months after we did the tour, that could be the beginning of something. Three weeks after we started the tour, when we were in the middle of Canada, uh, Richmond, British Columbia, city in BC, passed a right to a healthy environment. And by the time we got to Vancouver, six municipalities had signed on. Today, two years later, we have 143 communities. That includes all the big cities, Vancouver, uh, Montreal, Toronto. It includes uh, Yellowknife in the Arctic. It includes 51 communities in Ontario, all across the Canada. We've now recruited tens of thousands of people to volunteer working on the Blue Dot uh, movement. So now we're working on the provinces. Ontario has given us the biggest uh, province in Canada, as, as indicated very strongly, they support this. Quebec as well. So we're well on our way to getting ready to go to Ottawa. And I think this is a, a very exciting possibility to get people to start thinking uh, in a different way uh, about how we live and what is a healthy environment uh, for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. David, we are so honored to have you here and for all that you have done. We are going to take a few minutes of questions and then David has graciously agreed to stick around here for about 10 minutes to answer a few more. But we've got mic runners, so if anybody has a question briefly, but we're just so lucky you're here, no, David. Okay, any questions answer. that I see? Yes, right here, would you? Thanks, Anne. And if you could say your name and where you're from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. My name is Sipasha Zamini from Swaziland. Uh, for me, it's not necessarily a question, but it's a comment and actually an appreciation that in one of our sessions we were looking at uh, how can we better uh, uh, define community. And when you said uh, the interconnection between the earth, the, the earth the food that we, we are eating, it actually expands or better explain 
what community means to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Any other questions over there? Hello, Mal. John? Hello. Oh, there we go. Um, Molly, Fergus Falls, Minnesota, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. What um, advice would you give to teachers working with children um, regarding their connection to nature? Well, I love to, to give talks to children in Toronto because uh, I ask them, when you flush the toilet, do you know where it goes? When you turn on the tap to drink the water, do you know where it comes from? They don't know. But when I tell them that in both cases, Lake Ontario gives them their water and their sewage goes out into Lake Ontario, they begin to understand, wow, you know, nature is, is cycling. I think that for me, you know, there, there are two things. The first problem we face in Canada, Canada thinks of it, Canadians think of ourselves as, you know, we're, we're this land that's empty with small population and vast nature. 85% of Canadians live in big cities. And in a big city, in Toronto, for example, uh, I know people that live in air-conditioned apartments in the north end of Toronto. They go down into the basement, into their air-conditioned car, drive on the freeway into their air-conditioned office, connected by tunnels to all kinds of shopping areas. They don't have to go outside for days. <laughs> so the average Canadian child today spends less than eight minutes a day outside and more than six hours a day in front of a screen. So I think the biggest challenge is to get kids out. And it's not getting kids out doing experiments and all that stuff. It's just getting kids out and digging, digging nature. Like, I have three very young grandchildren, and, and they're, both of the, the mothers of these three kids are, my daughters are very active, one's working on a PhD. So I get to take care of these kids a lot. And through them, I see the world through their eyes. I didn't, I had forgotten what a magical place a puddle is, right? <laughs> Most kids don't want to go outside when it's raining. Well, we got rain gear, but a puddle, holy cow. You, first of all, you jump in it if you're a boy and start smashing around, but then, then after a while they start digging. Um, <laughs> okay start digging little channels and getting rivers and then forming dams and putting sticks in to become boats. A child's imagination is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, we shower them with all of these plastic things. They don't need that. The little collection of ends off, off uh, lumber that I've used become a wagon of blocks. They'll play with those for hours. But I, it's just the joy. I, we're very privileged where we live in, in, in Canada. We live on the shore of the Pacific Ocean and spend an enormous amount of time in the ocean, even in the big city. We catch smelt and we eat them. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. Get the kids outside. And they don't have to do experiments and all that stuff. Just get them outside and their imagination will run, run wild, I think. But, um, but I... I think once they get into school, the most critical things are uh, asking about the source of their water. They should go and see where their water comes from, see where their sewage goes. When you put garbage on the curb and the garbage man takes it away, where does it go? You know, when you, uh, uh, when you turn on the lights, where does that electricity come from? We are so ignorant in the most simple things. I, know, I was just in Tokyo last month. The entire population of Canada in one city and everywhere, when I met people, I kept saying, do you know where your water comes from? Not a clue. And I think, how, how can they get, how will nature provide the water for a city of this size? But we've got to understand that. You know, when, when the Fukushima accident happened, boy, Japanese were confronted with a real reality there of the cost of the kind of energy they get. And uh, we need to know those things, it seems to me. Okay, we're going to take one last question. Where is it going to come from? Over there. I don't see any in the back. I don't want to be missing anything. Thank you. Yep, it's on. Thank you. My name is Emily. I'm from Milwaukee. 
I have a question. When working with parochial schools or families that um, are uncomfortable with the topic of climate change and also with the topic of, um, well, maybe ma mainly climate change. Who, who's How, uncomfortable? Uh, the parochial schools. The teachers or the students? The teachers or parents that are uncomfortable with, with that topic. Um, how would you begin a conversation? Also evolution. Thank you. For, for parochial schools? I'm, I'm an atheist, so I'm a bad guy to be asking about <laughs> religion. But let me say, laudato si, this pope, I will kiss his hands, his feet, or any other part of his body. You say that it's difficult? Take them to laudato si, the pope's encyclical. That's where the conversation begins. And it's a magnificent document. And I, I think every Catholic should be proud of that, that document. It's a wonderful document. So I don't think that it should be a problem in parochial schools. The real difficulty we face uh, is, with the, uh, is, is with Christians, uh, the fundamentalist Christians who are wedded to the literal, literal interpretation of the Bible. That's a very small group of people, although very powerful, in the United States. Let me end on, on one story that, that uh, to me was so inspiring. When we were crossing Canada on our bus tour, a grade six teacher found our website for the Blue Dot movement and saw there was a two minute film on it, which I w had hoped would be shown here tonight. You would love it, but you can go to the Blue Dot uh, uh, website. Anyway, she was very inspired and took the film back to her class and the kids were so excited about it, they said, let's invite the mayor. This is in a town called the, the, the PA, P-A-S, in northern Manitoba. And it's a, it's a city that's got all kinds of problems between indigenous people and the, the non-indigenous people. But the, these kids took this to the mayor, or got the mayor to come to their class and watch the video. He then said, that's interesting. We should, why don't you bring it to city council at our next meeting? And the kids did. These grade six kids went to the meeting, showed the video, and said, we would like the PA, the PA to pass uh, legislation for a right to a healthy environment, and they unanimously passed it. So the power of children in their innocence to be able to present something, they've got no hidden agenda. It's very, very powerful impact. Thank you very much. David, thank you.